RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello cave dwellers, welcome to the cave. Today's a really exciting day for me. This has been teasing me from the shelves for a long time now. It's a factory sealed copy of IBM's PC-DOS 2000, which confusingly comes from 1998, getting on the year 2000 bandwagon as everyone was back then. And it's an opportunity today to open it, see what's inside, get that factory fresh smell as we break the seal and install it because I've never actually used PC-DOS or I've never used it knowingly. And we'll talk more about that later. It has a heritage and a story that is intertwined, but not inseparable from Microsoft's own MS-DOS. Again, a sealed copy here. I don't know if we'll open this today. We'll see how it goes. It might need an episode of its own, but we're going to explore it. And what better machine to put it on than an IBM branded PC over here? And what we're going to do is clean it up, check it works. And if I find anything interesting, I'll let you know. But the focus is really on the software today. So while I get the rubber gloves on and clean this up, let's go all the way back to 1981 and find out how IBM PC-DOS came into being. Let's touch on the origin story then. It all started with IBM's new prototype computer, the IBM PC. You've probably heard of it. IBM needed an operating system for their new PC and had been talking to digital research over here at length to get them a port of their popular CPM OS over to the Intel 8086 CPU being used in the PC, but progress was very slow. Meanwhile, over here, a chap named Tim Patterson was finding digital space equally frustrating. He designed a piece of hardware called the Z80 Softcard for the Apple II computer, a card with a Z80 CPU on it, which was supported by CPM. The Softcard was released by Microsoft and Apple II users could enjoy the delights of CPM, those lucky, lucky people. That link then takes us over to Microsoft, who had been around for five years at this stage, they had an operating system of their own, Microsoft Xenix. Heard of it? Well, it's certainly not as well known as their later offerings, but Xenix was a Unix variant and therefore a modular and true multi-user operating system. The first release was in 1980 and was compatible with the Z8001 processor, so it wasn't ready for the IBM PC and we wouldn't see an 8086 port until 1982. Anyway, being a Unix variant, Microsoft paid the license fees to AT&T and in turn licensed their OS to OEMs, including IBM, so there was a relationship in place between the two, and calls were made to invite Microsoft into the arena while the PC was being developed. It's tantalizing for many to think that PCs could have had a true Unix variant as standard and all the security that comes with it from the very start. We can but dream. Anyway, digital were gassing with IBM, Tim Patterson got bored of waiting, and so he knocked up QDOS, or Quick and Dirty Operating System, reportedly written by him in around six weeks, about the time it takes digital research to make a cup of tea. It was pretty much a clone of CPM, which worked on 8086 CPUs, and it didn't go under Microsoft's radar. IBM, needing to press on with releasing their PC, would negotiate a deal with Microsoft to provide the operating system, and they signed the contract in November 1980. Microsoft founder Bill Gates described it as the largest microcomputer software contract there has ever been. Digital research were allegedly still deciding if the water or the milk should go in the tea first. Legend has it they're still writing a technical document on the process. The IBM 5150 PC with operating system PC-DOS 1.0 would hit the shops nine months later. Microsoft hadn't knocked out an entirely new OS in those nine months though, no. Paul Allen of Microsoft had paid our friend Tim a little visit and negotiated a sub-license for his QDOS operating system, now renamed to 86DOS at his company Seattle Computer Products. With the license came an agreement that Tim would further develop it, which he duly did, and then he joined Microsoft. By February 1981, Tim and Microsoft's Bob O'Rear, who was Microsoft employee number seven, had it up and running on the prototype IBM PC. I'd say that's just three to four short months, but that's still four times longer than it took Tim to write the OS in the first place, so it's all relative. 
IBM had a history of legal cases in which they'd been accused of stealing software having had access to the source code from third parties. They didn't want any more of that. And this is why they subcontracted the development of the operating system out in the first place. They wanted to state their requirements, stand back and be outside the black box that it was developed in so no accusations could be leveled. Microsoft were happy with this. They got to retain the rights to the software and by using 86 DOS for the IBM PC and not redeveloping Xenix for the job, they had no license fee to pay AT&T. The buck stopped with Microsoft and that would become many, many bucks. IBM would hold this attitude for years to come and in another unrelated example, they contracted Sierra to create King's Quest for the PC Junior in 1984. In much the same way, IBM didn't want rights to the code, just a game to show off, and that engine would go on to make Sierra one of the most profitable video game companies in the world. Anyway, I digress, you get the picture. The result of this web of technology players then was that Microsoft released their improved 86 DOS, consisting of 4,000 lines of assembly code and residing in 8K of memory, in August 1980, and it was named MS-DOS 1.0. They then licensed it to IBM, who would release it as PC-DOS with the release of the IBM PC. The IBM PC was ready, PC-DOS was ready, and the similarity to the CPM operating system, well that wouldn't go unnoticed by digital research as we'll discover a little later. And that seems like as good a point as any to stop. We will come back to the history lesson later. And I know what you're all waiting for. You want to know what's inside this box. And so do I. So I'm going to get a knife. We're going to cut this open now. And uh, what I expect to find in there is probably going to be not dissimilar to what we would find in an MS-DOS box, a nice big user manual. It feels weighty as if there's a good manual in there with all the commands. But who knows, maybe IBM have thrown in a few extra surprises for us. Only one way to find out, let's get the knife and let's cut the seal. Opening brand new big box software, is there anything more satisfying? There's a bit of a dent on the top of mine, but it's otherwise immaculate and it's nice and glossy. It makes me weep when I look at software in DVD cases. This is how software is supposed to be supplied. Inside, we find a lovely big thick manual and then all of the other pamphlets to tell you the things that they actually forgot to put in that manual. And it wouldn't be big box software without a license agreement. But to make sure we're completely aware of that, this first leaflet tells us that we should read the license agreement. This isn't it, it's just telling us that we need to read it in multiple languages. Thanks IBM. Then we have the license agreement itself here, again in every language. And for me here in the UK, there's a regional edition which states that the Sales of Goods Act 1979 trumps IBM's own terms in the software license agreement. So on these shores, IBM remains liable if this software causes me death or personal injury. Always reassuring to know. Onto the meaty manual itself, and do you notice anything odd? Yes, it says PC-DOS 7 in great big letters on the front, but I thought this was PC-DOS 2000. Well, we'll find out why when we return to the timeline, but in short, they're essentially the same thing. So everything in PC-DOS 7, and therefore the manual, is applicable to our installation. And it's just lovely. I didn't have a manual when I first got a PC, so I just typed help and worked through all of the commands one by one, figuring out what they did. What I wouldn't have given for this or the MS-DOS equivalent manual way back then. Now who doesn't love a certificate? This is our proof of entitlement to use the product, so for the rest of the episode I will be behaving with a greater sense of entitlement than usual. But what if I do need some help? Well, there's a customer service and support leaflet here, but before I reach for my phone, it only applies to the US, Canada and Puerto Rico. That entitled feeling didn't last very long at all. The important customer information then continues with this sheet of paper which tells us that the license agreement, you know, the one that the other bit of paper told us we had to read, takes priority over the license agreement in the manual. So make sure you read the right license. And of course, buried in here, we've got unsolicited mail from Symantec with a special offer to get a 12-month subscription free of Norton Antivirus, even though IBM include their own antivirus software as part of PC-DOS, so it doesn't exactly fill you with confidence in their product. The website is long gone, but thanks to the Wayback Machine, we can see what it would have looked like if you went there to try and take up the offer. 
The final pamphlet in here is a year 2000 service reminder, which is basically IBM's get out of jail free card. You've bought this, it has 2000 in the title, it's a year 2000 compliant product, but this leaflet tells us that, yeah, you know, it's year 2000 ready, but you might need to install some updates before then, just to make sure that it's still ready. And then we find buried in the box our discs here. They're sealed and look at them glistening under the studio lights, having waited for this day for 22 years. I can sense their excitement. Let's set you free little diskettes and get you installed. You may have noticed that the PC I'm using for this is a lot cleaner than at the start of the episode. I did give it a quick clean up and test it to make sure that everything is okay and it's come up really nicely, I'm really happy with it. Yeah, there's a few bumps and scrapes still on the metalwork, but this isn't a refurbishment episode and I think it looks pretty good for a quick scrub. So let's start the installation and while I do that, let's carry on learning about the events which take us up to the release of this PC-DOS 2000. Right, where were we then? Digital Research weren't very happy about PC-DOS being supplied by Microsoft with the new IBM PC, but they had ample chances. CPM86 for the 8086 CPU, as the name implies, was slated for release as far back as November 1979, but was repeatedly delayed, and differences in opinion over license fees and non-disclosure agreements led to that opening for Microsoft to sneak in. Sneaky old Bill Gates. When the deal became known, Gary Kildall, one of the founders of Digital Research, threatened to sue IBM, and to be fair to them, they probably had a pretty good case for it given the similarities in the software. In avoiding touching the source code to avoid legal battles, IBM found themselves faced with a legal battle. Great job, IBM. A compromise was found, though, to douse the flames. IBM would offer CPM86 as an alternative operating system with the PC. In fact, three operating systems were available with the IBM PC at launch. They were PC-DOS, CPM86 and UCSD P-System, the latter having an emphasis on making applications portable and contained within virtual machines. It's well worth reading up on, but that's not where our attention lies today. Digital Research now had their wish an OS as an option for the IBM PC, but the playing field wasn't exactly level. If you wanted PC-DOS for your PC, it would cost you $40. If you wanted CPM86, it was a whopping $240. And with magazines giving them comparable reviews, it was no surprise that the cheaper option became the OS of choice and only 3.5% of buyers opted for CPM. The press continued to speculate that Microsoft were saving features such as multitasking for the big release of their Xenix OS for the 8086 computers, and that did actually make perfect sense. With the release of Intel's new 286 CPU, we would have hardware multitasking features which weren't being used. However, the symbiotic MS-DOS and PC-DOS relationship continued to evolve down our timeline, with Microsoft at the development helm for PC-DOS 1.1, which would also be released as MS-DOS 1.25 in 1982. Then MS-DOS 2 was closely followed by PC-DOS 2, in which we'd see the appearance of the F-Disk utility, essential for prepping your hard disks, as well as driver support for hardware devices beyond what the BIOS supported. In 84, a bunch of tweaks were rolled up into MS-DOS 2.11, including support for foreign language characters, and everyone from Hewlett Packard to Compaq and Tandy were shipping it with their new machines and IBM PC clones. Over 200 manufacturers in total had a license to distribute MS-DOS with their hardware. In August 84, we'd see MS-DOS 3.0 and with it PC-DOS 3.0, in which development continued with tweaks for new storage devices and larger hard disks, but planned networking features for that release were deemed too buggy and omitted. MS-DOS 3.1 and PC-DOS 3.1 would see this fixed at the end of 84 and 85. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of the many features, bug fixes and twists and turns that all of these releases took. As you can see, PC-DOS and MS-DOS are effectively the same thing at this point. Microsoft might release MS-DOS only to include a few tweaks in the next PC-DOS release and then roll those updates again and a lot more in the next MS-DOS release. They sometimes got a little out of step, but they would fall back into line. They were essentially the very same operating system. There would be minor forks in the road like when IBM released their PS2 line of computers in 1987 and with it PC-DOS 3.3, an upgrade which was written completely by IBM with no development from Microsoft, but normality would return for the next release. It would be MS-DOS and PC-DOS 5 in 1991 which would be the very last version that the two companies would share the full code for. 
This was a major upgrade which needed to restore confidence after a bug-ridden version 4, and sure enough it did. But the company's priorities were fast changing. As far back as 1985, a joint development agreement was drawn up between Microsoft and IBM to create a new OS codenamed CB-DOS, and this would result in the operating system OS 2, released in 1987, and with it, an almighty feud. The argument was largely based around Microsoft's positioning of its own Windows products in relation to OS 2, and the result was the end of the development relationship in 1992, another saga that we must cover sometime. So, in 1992, MS-DOS and IBM's PC-DOS would divorce, choose their favourite child and continue development on their own with only a cheap bottle of sangria for company and a photo book of happier memories. Bad times. And it's that next stage of development that will take us up to our boxed copy of PC-DOS 2000. But before we get there, let's pop back and see how I'm progressing with it. Well, installation was pretty painless and I have captured the display for you so that we can run through it. Booting from the floppy disk to get started and then using the F-Disk utility here to prepare the hard disk. The machine had a FAT32 partition on it already and that file system isn't actually supported by PC-DOS 2000 so we've had to delete that. It sees it here as a non-DOS partition and then we create our own one. There we go. Then we create a new partition using all of the space available. Aside from IBM branding on the main menu, FDisk is identical to the MS-DOS one that I'm used to. And after a reboot, the installation can begin from the floppy disk. It then finds our partition and formats it, and then once again, almost identical menus to those of the MS-DOS installation, until we get to the optional extras, where we get some new options. These are PCMCIA support using the Phoenix Card Manager software, IBM Antivirus, that Rex language support, stacker for drive compression, and a backup program. And then we'll run through all six floppy disks, which thankfully worked and the installation completed. On first boot from the hard disk, the IBM antivirus kicks in and they were kind enough not to include any viruses in the installation. So we're all done and ready to go. And then we're at the familiar DOS prompt. And you'd have no idea really that this wasn't MS-DOS without doing some digging around. The version command shows that we're running PC-DOS 7 revision 1. And then the mem command shows that a clean installation allows the largest executable program before we go anywhere near config files and autoexec files to tweak it is 582k. Not great, not terrible. It's DOS, I'm not sure I was expecting anything else to be honest. In the DOS folder, we can see new and old utilities. Old favorites are there like check disk and defrag, as well as the high mem driver and EMM386 memory manager. But noticeable in his absence is edit. That's replaced with the E text editor. And that looks like this. Once you get the hang of the shortcuts, it's nice to use. You can open multiple files at once, which is handy, but it's not groundbreaking, especially in 98. For something a bit more complex, we can dip into Rex. And there is a comprehensive help system included, which gives us examples of what we can do with that. Flicking through it, it looks far more comprehensive than what I could have done with a basic batch file in MS-DOS. So that really is a nice feature. I thought I'd throw a game on just to see if we come across any compatibility issues. And of course, my DOS game of choice is SimCity 2000, which throws up an error about a lack of RAM, but carries on regardless just fine. And there's SimCity looking as fine as ever. Now I've still got lots of exploring to do, so before I come to my final conclusion, let's finish off the history lesson of how we got to PC-DOS 2000, and then we'll come back to the desk. We're on the finishing straight now to take us up to my PC-DOS 2000, the last version of IBM's OS to have a retail release. It was in March 1993 when MS-DOS 6 was released, and in June IBM separately developed PC-DOS 6.1, and now we'd start to see a divergence. Among other changes, IBM ditched Microsoft's Cube Basic from the package and replaced the MS-DOS editor, the edit executable that we all know and love and tweaked our config and auto-exec files with, they replaced that with the IBM e-editor. PC-DOS 7 would come in 1995 and had the Rex programming language added, a programming language created by Mike Cowleyshaw at IBM, which is particularly useful for scripting purposes. It's a really useful tool. You'll also find that in the Amiga OS, incidentally. 
IBM also included support for the XDF floppy disk format so you could format a standard 1.44 megabyte floppy disk to a 1.86 megabyte capacity, and work was done to reduce the memory footprint and optimize the whole thing. IBM engineers no doubt determined to outdo Microsoft and offer the ultimate version of DOS. Over at Microsoft, the last standalone release of MS-DOS would be version 6.22, with MS-DOS 7 becoming part of the consumer Windows releases, which pulled itself up from an MS-DOS boot stage. But Microsoft were also working on a Windows NT range of OSs, a completely new operating system developed with the help of Dave Cutler, who moved to Microsoft in 1988 to work on it. Windows NT would evolve through to Windows XP and beyond when the 9x flavors of Windows were retired, and with that their dependency on an MS-DOS-based boot process. So where did this leave IBM and PC-DOS? Well, in 1998 we come to my copy of PC-DOS 2000, the final retail release. Oddly, the discs here say PC-DOS 2000 includes PC-DOS 7. PC-DOS 2000 is PC-DOS 7. <laughs> it just has updates to prepare it for the year 2000. IBM wanted some of that Millennium bug cash, and as PC-DOS was now gaining traction in the embedded software market, its customers no doubt were happy to see that these concerns were being addressed two years before the event. So what exactly did we learn from breaking the seal on the box today? Well, there were no great revelations in the software itself. It looks, feels, and smells very much like the MS-DOS that I'm familiar with, albeit with the IBM logo sometimes in places where you might normally see the Microsoft one. Now, the improvements really came from the applications that were bundled as part of it, applications like Rex, which I especially liked, and any fine tuning that had happened under the hood, it wasn't really noticeable. Um, one good thing to say about that though is it didn't break compatibility. All of my tests passed with flying colors, so that's one thing that it's got going for it. I even performed an in-place installation on my 486, which had DOS 6.22 installed. It installed PC-DOS right into the existing DOS folder without formatting the machine, and everything just continued to work identically. CD-ROM drivers, sound card drivers, all remained in the auto-exec and config files, and they just worked. Missing MS-DOS utilities like edit remained on the drive and worked, so I kind of had the best of both worlds there now. Both DOS versions merged into one folder and playing together happily, which just goes to show how identical it is. And yes, Windows 3.11, which was already on the 486, continued to run without any issues. What is noticeable in its absence in the modern day is support for the FAT32 file system, but this would also appear later in PC-DOS 7.1, just as it did in later MS-DOS versions. Yes, it is the final boxed release, but between 1999 and 2003, PC-DOS continued to appear in tweaked and updated form, but not as a boxed product. It was the underlying OS used in such things as recovery partitions and disk imaging tools, some of which I've used in IT support. So I learned today that yes, I have used PC-DOS unknowingly in the past, it was just quietly working away behind the scenes. Aside from it being nice seeing an IBM OS appear on an IBM branded computer, is there any reason to choose this over MS-DOS, FreeDOS, or any other alternative? I can't really think of a killer app that will run on this that won't run on any of the others, to be honest. Despite IBM and Microsoft diverging five years before it was released, they are very much the same product. And I just can't tell you to drop everything and turn to PC-DOS for any particular reason other than out of curiosity, as I've done today. It has been fascinating though, researching the history of the software, and while I've tried to stick tightly to the story as it relates to PC-DOS, with a couple of tangents, there's so much more to share with you about the DOS wars, of how digital research rebranded CPM86 and spurred Microsoft into improving MS-DOS in response, of the multitasking capabilities that appeared in MS-DOS 4, and of Microsoft's lawsuit with Stack Electronics for the drive compression software included in MS-DOS, and of how IBM then put that very same stack of software into PC-DOS. There are many, many tangents that uh, we could go off on. And what became of that Microsoft Xenix operating system? All slightly too far off topic for today, but all things you might want to look further into if it's grabbed your attention and things that we'll probably explore on the channel in future. I hope you've enjoyed it though. Do share your PC-DOS war stories with me if you have any, and thank you as always for watching and subscribing as we approach the big 100,000 subscribers. Take care.
If you enjoy my content and would like to support The Cave while receiving a completely ad-free experience and access to releases one week before they go public, then visit patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers. Thank you for your support.